Oh, hello everyone. So this little lecture uh, is a follow-up on the one that came before. So the lecture right before this was about how evolution can sometimes be incredibly rapid. And this lecture is the opposite. And then today I'm going to talk about how evolution can be incredibly slow. And I'm going to start out with a story involving this organism right here. So this is a fossil of a fish, a type of fish called the coelacanth. This fossil right here is about 65 million years old. And on the top diagram, you can see a picture of the fossil itself. And then on the bottom is an outline showing some of the details that are present in that picture of the coelacanth. A coelacanth is a type of fish called the lobed finned fish. And you can see the lobed fins that it has right here, as opposed to uh, one of the ray finned fishes. Lobe finned fishes are actually uh, more closely related to us than they are to other fishes. Now, coelacanths were relatively well known in the fossil record. They had been found uh, in a number of different localities and geologic eras, um, but they were thought to have gone extinct tens of millions of years ago until a spectacularly interesting event happened. This is the paper that, re that resulted from that event. So this happened in late December 1938 um, in South Africa. Local museum curator named Marjorie Courtney Latimer was looking at some fish that had been brought in by local fishermen, and she saw this specimen that's pictured right here. I'm not sure if she knew exactly what it was, but she knew that it was special. She sent it immediately to Dr. Smith, who was a, a scientist, a ichthyologist at Rhodes University, and he identified it as a living, well, it was dead. He identified it as a coelacanth. And so this is... This puts coelacanth in a type of taxa that's sometimes known as a Lazarus taxon, like being raised from the dead. This is a fish that was thought to have been extinct for 60 million years or so, and then suddenly was captured by a fisherman. Now we know that coelacanths are uh, around in deeper parts of the ocean. For example, in the Indian Ocean, they can be commonly found. Here's a picture of one today, and you can see its lobed fins. And it's actually still recognizable. Even if you compare this living picture of the coelacanth to the fossil that I just showed you that's 65 million years old, you'll see that there aren't tremendously large differences. Of course, it's easy to say this if you're not a coelacanth. Maybe to them, the subtle differences are important. But still, the overall body form is similar to what we see in its ancestor. And there are other organisms around that fit into this category as well as they're sometimes called living fossils. Um, here's an example. Uh, this might look like a lizard to you, but it's not a lizard. This is an animal called a tuatara. There are two species of tuatara. They live only in small offshore islands of New Zealand. And they are the sister group to squamates, that's snakes and lizards. So they're the closest living relative of all snakes and lizards. And these two ataras, again, are superficially similar in their body form to organisms that we find in the fossil record tens of millions of years ago. Why might we expect an organism like a two atara to have stasis or lack of change over long periods of time? Well, maybe that organism lives in a stable habitat. It's very well adapted to that habitat and there's no need for it to change or evolve through time. And in fact, maybe it's under stabilizing natural selection that causes it to not change. Uh, maybe the organism has evolved really strong competitive ability and so Things that would influence the evolution of other organisms, like competition among relatives, don't affect that organism. Uh, maybe it's evolved into a rare niche, and so it doesn't experience very much competition from other lineages. So there are lots of explanations that are out there for stasis uh, in any particular group. There's an expression to capture this idea that sometimes evolution can be extremely slow and conservative. This is a quote from Stephen Jay Gould, who promoted this idea that evolution can be really slow sometimes. Stasis is data. That means that we shouldn't only look at things that change as uh, part of our telling the story of macroevolution. We should also look for times and places in the fossil record where things seem to stay the same for a long time. Gould developed this idea of stasis of data into a whole theory of macroevolution called punctuated equilibrium. So this is an important term for you to know. It's still a theory that's around in macroevolution, maybe a little bit less popular than it was 10 years ago, but it's still around. So punctuated equilibrium is the theory that evolutionary change only happens during speciation events, with other times characterized by stasis or lack of change. And so we can see that in this upper diagram here that's meant to picture the process of punctuated equilibrium. On the y-axis, we have the morphology of a species. This is kind of an abstract axis, but you can just think of it as like, as things get farther apart on that axis, they get more different. We have time on the y-axis. And lineages go along for a million years or so, 
without any change at all in their morphology. And then right at the moment of speciation, you get changes into two very different forms, which then themselves stay the same after that moment of speciation. And you can sometimes have speciation where the um, parent lineage continues on and the, only the one of the offspring lineages is different or both of them can be different and so on. The characteristic of this punctuated equilibrium view of life is that lineages are constant most of the time and you see rapid change associated with speciation events. This is often contrasted with a different view of phyletic gradualism where lineages change in their morphology steadily uh, and nothing special happens at speciation events. So that's the phyletic gradualism view. Punctuated equilibrium was very popular in paleontology for a long time, and there are lots of uh, groups in the fossil record that experience stasis for long periods of time and rare intervals of lots of change, but there are also lots of other patterns in the fossil record. In fact, uh, myself with some colleagues here at the University of Idaho wrote a paper that was arguing that some of the things that we see as part of punctuated equilibrium do happen, but it's not correct to link, link them all together into one grand theory that's meant to explain all of life on Earth. Life on Earth is much too complicated and variable for that, especially over macroevolutionary timescales. And in that paper, we had this picture of hypothetical evolutionary scenarios. Uh, these are kind of like that diagram that I had before, but flipped on their side, showing what time series data and phylog phylogenetic data might look like under a world where we had punctuated change, gradual change, and everything in between. The other thing that has happened in our understanding of stasis is that we can now study the genomes of living fossils. And the studies of the genomes of living fossils has been, I think, surprising for some people because these genomes can be dynamic and sometimes uh, quite dynamic. Here's a paper called Rapid Molecular Evolution in a Living Fossil by Hay et al. And in this paper, they show that the rate of evolution uh, in terms of substitutions per base per million years of Tuatara is uh, actually higher than what we see in many other related organisms. And so rather than having slow molecular evolution, these Tuataras have fast evolution. What you can see, I think, by looking at living fossils in detail is a wide range of outcomes. So some traits really are uh, basically static through long periods of time. Other traits might change. Some molecules don't change very much. Some parts of their genome change rapidly. And this is kind of a more mosaic view about rates of evolution, that rates of evolution vary among body parts and among lineages in lots of different ways. So in general, rates of evolution are uh, highly variable. And that kind of ties together the lecture that I gave on rapid evolution and slow evolution. So we have lots of reasons why we might explain rapid evolution or slow evolution. Um, and we shouldn't be surprised to find either one. Thank you.